Pat, what does being a great session player mean to you? I think, uh, you know, a big part of it is being flexible. We're all asked to be, to fit into different situations and be kind of like a chameleon in, in musically. Um, so yeah, being, being flexible, being, uh, easy to work with. And does that flexibility extend, I guess, beyond just like the, the vision of it, but someone may, you may have an idea about how a certain sound should roll. And then the artist is trying to explain that to you. And it may not be explained in the best terminology that makes sense from, you know, the sure. musician aspect. And so that's kind of flexibility and like the interactions of folks as well. A lot of times your first impression of a song or what your part of the song is going to be may need to be adjusted. And so you have to not be too attached to it. So in your early days of, of falling in love with music and playing your instrument, was there a particular style of music that you leaned towards initially, or were you a chameleon as a music fan as well in the early days of discovering the wonderful experience of music? I think that's what attracted me to being a studio musician was that I really liked everything. I like all kinds of music. So yeah, not anything in particular, but just, yeah, being all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And when did you start to recognize that there was a, there could be a career path for that? Was that something that was aware? Was there anyone in your family like around you that you saw that was a musician or, or someone that had been successful with that? Um, or what was your, what was your path like to figure out, well, I could, I could maybe play my instrument for a living. Probably the very first one was my brother who's 10 years older and he, he was into the folk scene and, uh, we shared a, a bedroom. And so there was, um, always music going on. He was playing guitar and he was playing banjo. I took some formal lessons too um, that were helpful. Um, but it wasn't long after that that I started getting into bands, you know, and then and learning from other players. And did you enjoy for formal lessons, or did you? I found I found that there's a there's an interesting split between that, and it seems to be that a lot of session players lean towards. I really enjoyed learning my instrument through like playing along to records. But then there's a few folks that are that are like, you know, the, the, the exercises that I learned in those early days have been helpful. Yeah. And so I'm always curious to see how someone's, ex what someone's experience was like with like traditional lessons when you're learning your instrument. My, I think I learned more from the casual playing. The formal lesson thing was cool and it was, it was another layer to the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that I, I learned a ton, um, but it was helpful. I mean, it's yeah. all helpful. There's there are probably different fundamentals of that 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 uh, that you don't get as much from just playing along. You know, you pick it up eventually, but that you can focus in on, or be able to go to your instructor and say, "Hey, you know, I was playing along to this song, and I, I know that I remember doing that when I was a kid. I was playing along this song, and I just can't figure out this this voicing or what they were doing. You right, know? and I really want to know how to play this song. Right, and then they would have that experience to be able to listen to it and say, "Oh, it's you know, it's this." sort of thing and yeah i find that can be oh definitely you know, helpful yeah so then so then but you were pretty quick into starting to play play in bands and stuff so did you where where did you start to find those bands did you start them or did you just find ones that existed and kind of jump in right off the top was well, playing with my brother he had a little gig at a restaurant i started coming to play with him and then when i was 18 he had the idea to move to montana to be um uh, to ski and to play in ski areas. And so uh, when I graduated high school, that summer I moved to Montana to be with him and start a band. And uh, it was sort of my college experience, but it was fantastic because I was playing music in the evenings, skiing during the day, wow. uh, living in Montana. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was great. Nice. And so what ended up leading you to Nashville? You know, ever since I've, you know, I, as a kid and, and growing up and loving music, I would, you know, look at albums and, and I would see, you know, you start to follow the different studio players that would be on the albums that you would love. And so I knew that I was always interested in that. Out of Montana, I moved back to LA for a while and tried to break into the studio scene um, a little bit, but it, LA was so hard to navigate, um, for me anyway. Because of the distance between things, or yeah, just it's so hard to even know where everything is, mm -hmm. you know. Which is a really great thing to mention about Nashville. 
how uh, the, the I mean, one of the reasons maybe that our community is so strong is how centrally located everything is. Yeah, I took one trip here. On the flight, I met Harlan Howard. I met Reggie Young. Later that night at a restaurant, I met Mickey Newberry. I would go to a, a grocery store. I ran into Emmylou Harris. It was like, oh my gosh, this is it. It was like uh -huh. an epiphany. So, and everything was so easy to, it was like in Music Row, you got Berry Hill, you know, and then you have some outer lying areas, you know, things that are going on too. Mm -hmm. But that was the center. It was, it was really easy to, to see where everything was going on. It was cheaper to live at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it had a lot going for it. Yeah. And did you move here for a specific intention or was it just kind of a general idea that this is the environment I need to be in. I think anybody that moves here is kind of a similar story. It's, I kind of I think of it like a grad school. You know, you're you're in your area wherever you are, and you get to be good, and you get to be like one of the better players in that town, and you're playing all the gigs, and and it's fun. And then you're kind of thinking, well, you know, let's take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my thinking. I I wanted to learn how to play better. I wanted to learn how to write better. And of course, like I was saying, I was always interested in studio playing because I love so many different kinds of music. It's fun to, you know, be in a band and it's fun to, to be a side man. Those are all really great things. But the same thing all the time just didn't work with me as well. Um, so I was always intrigued to, to uh, with studio work and um, this just seemed like the best place to do it. And did you, when you got here, what, did your first gig start to end up like in the studio world because you were focused on that or did it start live and then transition in? What was your process like? It started live, um, which I think is a common story. You know, um, I got to town, started sitting in with people uh, that led to some local gigs that led to some auditions for uh, touring and toured for a while. And I loved it. You know, touring was great, you know, the the whole thing. And then around 93, I, I was on this really great tour. And then the artist just decided that they didn't want to do it anymore. And I realized that I couldn't have all my well-being wrapped up in, in one person. And I had this desire to be a studio player. So I, that's when I made the jump. Now you're in town. You're kind of, I'm trying to stay off, stay off the road. Where do you go to start finding work in the studio? We didn't call it networking back then, but it was like you go out and you link up with songwriters, you know, and they need somebody to play the bluebird with, you know, and I didn't know I was doing this, but I was kind of aligning myself with writers that were starting out too. And so we were kind of coming up together and then they, they would need to like record a guitar vocal of their song or, and then gradually just one by one, you know, you get one client and, and that leads to two and, and then, you know, it just gradually gets, you know, this writer, you know, hires you from this session and the more, the more you work, the more you. That idea of growing together, I think is so valuable. I know for me, when I moved to Nashville, and I think most people are, you know, this way, you move here for the purpose of trying to go to grad school, you know, you're the best in your area, and you want to get to that next level. So you get there, and then you quickly realize that all the people that are the in the best in their areas have also came here. Yeah, and now you're just kind of average. Yeah, you know, and you and you need to figure out how the, the town works as well, and uh, the community and stuff. Um, but but the goal is you have these your eyes set on the on the big opportunities, not recognizing that those opportunities are kind of already covered by the people that have come in the generation before you have worked their way up right they're at that point and they've built the trust within the decision makers to to for those decision makers to know that they can trust the, this group of individuals right. for that because they've put in their time and, exactly. and they've you know they've earned that but we come in young and hungry and excited and thinking well i i work my butt off i, I know that i have you know talent and i'm willing to do anything that it takes but just that tenacity itself isn't enough because it takes that relationship to be built right um already and that's something that it took me a little bit to figure out but you figure it out pretty quickly you know right. once you get to town but and and the other thing is that you, you don't as a session musician it's very challenging to like call a studio and get a job or call a producer and get right. a job because those studios and producers have to in the same way trust the people that they're bringing in because they're being entrusted with very substantial budgets with people paying a lot of money and putting a lot on the line. And it's difficult to take a shot on someone that they have like kind of a good feeling about sure. regardless of how talented they are, because there's a system for making sure that it gets done. 
So then where do you go? Mm -hmm. And the thing that has continued to come up with a lot of folks is um, songwriters. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it's amazing how many calls I get as a studio owner every week from people that are new to town, drummer, guitar player, you know, bass player, looking for gigs and um, they want to send their demo reel. I'm like, I'm happy to talk to you and I'd love to help you out, but I can't put you on a session tomorrow. Right. You just moved to town and you, you know. Right. Um, so there's things to, and that was a lot of what inspired us to start creating this community. Right. So we could provide, you know, those, those resources for folks. So you figure that out and you find your um, tribe, I guess, you know, right. that you come up with, you grow together and it's the songwriters that are starting out also, but it's also the players that are starting out also, mm-hmm. which you mentioned, which is so great. So did you, where did you start to meet those, those players? Cause the songwriters, it makes sense. You go to the rounds, you kind of, right. you know, you, you, you meet them and stuff. Were there, were there also places that you would go specifically to kind of like identify those players that you would connect with? And how did those relationships build? You would build a relationship with maybe a keyboard player in, in a band that was playing at a club and, and he would let you sit in like late at night or something like that. And so you start to get like meet other players and, and there were jam nights. Um, it seemed like I would go out, you know, most, you know, every chance that I could just to to play wherever you can to, to be seen mm-hmm. um, and to start building relationships with other players. And then there would always be, you know, there's a network with players that, um, because they're hearing about jobs coming up and they may be a, a drummer, but they hear about a job for a guitar player. And so, you know, we were, you know, constantly passing your number out to everybody. And, Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. It's better to try to align yourself with a com that common level instead of, you know, trying to appeal to guys that were already the A team or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, doing all the work. I, I imagine at some point you probably had some players that you enjoyed playing with, but maybe you started to see things in their personality or their work ethic that maybe didn't point them towards a long-term career, but mm-hmm. maybe you enjoyed creatively playing with them. Mm-hmm. Is, it, did you ever have an experience where it was kind of a, important to be aware of that? And maybe even though it was kind of like a fun hang, you saw how that could maybe lead down a, a, a place that's not really moving forward. Whereas there's, maybe another group or another couple people on another side where you see they really got it together. They're, I sure. you know, connect. Were there ever any tough decisions like that where you had to sort of decide to move away from s- certain things? Yeah, and some of those decisions are kind of subconscious. You know, you, you gravitate towards the ones that are making good decisions and, and moving in the right direction. Um, but sure, you learn from everybody. You know, you learn from people doing well and you learn from people making mistakes. Mm-hmm. And hopefully you don't have to repeat those mistakes, you know, but... So yeah, but you learn from everybody. So do you, do you do you remember any of the like first sessions where you got or maybe where your first session came from where you got called in for for something through one of those relationships? Real early on after playing some gigs with some guys um you know, it was real common to have uh what we call slams, you know, where you have, you know, you record 10 songs um you know, and real inexpensively, and everybody's kind of at the same level, and the you know the songwriters are are usually pretty new too, and that and everybody was it was great because everybody was kind of learning at the same time. You know, mm. what sort of skills do you feel like you might a musician might build from those types of slam sessions where you have to very quickly knock out a bunch of songs, maybe switch switch vibe and and tone and you know and style uh, on the fly. Uh, how does that prepare you for the next level of the career as a hired musician? It's great training, you know, you're, because you're, you're doing so much work. It's the volume of work. You know, if you're working on the ninth song of the evening, you know, and it's late and you, it, you're tempted to, to not, you know, to phone it in or, or whatever, but really that's the kiss of death. If you, if you can somehow maintain your, your focus and realize that this is leading to something. So that idea of just kind of the repetition, repetition of working through these sessions that have, you know, a ton of songs on them and, you know, and going through, it allows you to build some different approaches and be able to quickly kind of switch between ideas to be able to be that flexible chameleon that, yeah that you talked about. And yeah. then once you're in that position where now you're working on LP master sessions, 
that gives you a bit more time and ability to be able to kind of chase ideas down. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that changes in that process that now, you, now there's a new thing that you have to learn because of that extra amount of time? It's still the same thing. It just, it's just easier to be excited about it, you know, or interested about it because mm -hmm. it means more and, and, and you're getting paid more too, but you're really pulling from your experience of doing all those demos and, and just getting used to the playing with headphones, you know, and playing with a click and getting your mix together to where you can hear what you need to hear. All those things are, are just, it's great to have all that experience, you know, with those demos that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, so an important part of being a great session player, aside from being able to play your instrument, is the instruments that you have at your disposal to be able to have that variety of, you know, tonal palette to be able to bring into something. What was your approach for figuring out, you know, how you could, how you started to develop your arsenal of tools that you bring to a session with you? When I first moved here, I, I played both acoustic and electric. And um, I kind of quickly saw that what it took to be an electric player as opposed to an acoustic player, um, I just was more naturally fitted for acoustic. Why um, was that? It was interesting to me because at the time, especially when I when I first started doing sessions, there was it was more country music. Country electric guitar just never really was a comfortable thing for me. I I I would do you know rock stuff would more natural, pop stuff was more natural, but the country thing was kind of foreign. And when I first got here too, it was the the big rack thing, you know, where they have like this refrigerator full of of stuff. Like a lot of processors and, and yeah. big hardware effects as opposed to just like a pedal board, right? And, and you know, now it's like pedal boards and amps. But at the time it was just daunting. It was like, how am I going to do this? You know, I'm, I did, and, but I moved to town with a bunch of really great acoustic guitars. And so I was kind of ahead in that that part of the thing. So it was kind of a natural thing that I would be an acoustic player. And too, I like to play mandolin and, and banjo and mm -hmm. bazooki and things like that. So what were the basic food groups that you feel like you were fortunate to have a nice arsenal of things when you got here, but what were the basic food groups that you saw as you got into those sessions that like you really needed to have at your disposal to cover your bases in general? At least two or three really solid acoustic guitars. Um, and, and from the main, you know, a good solid Martin, a good solid Gibson. And then I've got a Larivee too, that, that is sort of a, a moderner sound, uh, different woods, you know, a good mahogany. And what do you listen for in a guitar when you're, when you're choosing that? Is there something that you, that you've learned over the years specifically to kind of feel out as, as uh, a guitar that's going to record better than maybe others? You know, there's, a big part of it is how it feels and how it how it feels to play. And I'm not one to have like 50 guitars, you know, uh, or 100. I mean, there's guys that have, that's super common. Mm -hmm. I only have what I use, but, you know, you've got to cover those, those main food group kind of sounds, like a good solid dreadnought, you know, a small body, a high strung, a 12 string, a gut string, a resonator, dobro, and then you get into the mandolins and the bazookis. And, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for some kind of new little thing to come around, something like, you know, a dulcimer or, you know, whatever, um, to cover those other little things, because that can really help too, uh, just spice up a track that maybe has a different color um, mm -hmm. than just acoustic guitar. But they're all different, you know? But at the same time, you know, I go, whenever I go look at guitars, I'm, I play them and it's like, yeah, this is cool, but I have this sound. I'm really, I'm not interested in getting another guitar that sounds like one I already have. Mm -hmm. So, but if it's different um, in a funky way or a, a however different, um, then yeah, you know, I'll consider buying it. Do you think once you surpass like just quality guitar in general, do you find that it's more about 
the way that it's played than like the guitar itself or do, or are there certain guitars that you found that are just like this guitar just records better than other similar styles for some reason or another yeah there are certain things like tonally like it'll be too boomy but really i think it's more important to how it makes you play like a guitar will it just sort of they give you ideas you know it's like i pick up one guitar and you play a certain way to it and then you pick up another guitar and you just you don't play the same way it's mm -hmm. like something about it makes you plays differently and that's something that's more just sort of internalized and instinctual and something that you really just recognize you just you, you don't pick it you don't look at it and then pick it up and play it different it's just how it feels and it sort of leads you a certain way and then that's probably that's what seems to make the bigger difference for the most part i mean it on the other side of the coin you, you know if you look and you have an arch top or something you're naturally going to pick it up and do some kind of swing thing or something you know mm -hmm. or something old sounding but for yeah for the most part guitar they sort of make you do different things so you would say for someone that's trying to build their arsenal maybe just get out to the guitar shop just play some and see which ones sort of pull you towards an inspired state in the yeah playing of it yeah play play everything and there's a uh there's a music store in town fanny's music in east nashville that has i go by there like once a month and and just because they get all these it's it's all used stuff and then mm -hmm. and but it's great because you you can just kind of go through and it's it's not the usual things that you would see at a normal guitar, guitar shop. Yeah, you just play everything. And then all, there have been a number of times where I sit down and play a guitar and just go, man, I don't have this sound. This really feels good, you know? And then you have to, the other step to that though is that, will it play in tune? Because it can be the coolest guitar, you know, vintage or whatever. But if it's not going to play in tune, it's not going to do me any good. Then I would usually take it to, you know, the guy that I work with, Joe Glazier, and and see if can this play in tune. Then it's a, a useful tool. So mentioning someone like Joe Glazier and the importance of setup and intonation and that sort of thing, um, they can make a huge difference in, yes. in the way that a guitar records. Yeah. Because if it's, if it's not, then obviously it's not going to be sitting well uh, pitch-wise with right everything else and you're going to be limited on where you can play it for wh where it is going to be sitting well right um so you're someone who you found a guitar tech that you really um trust and and like their work um and you take your instruments to them is it a, how how often are you having your instruments kind of in for their their uh for their annual checkup you know it's funny each guitar is different too um some require more care but I'm I'm at the shop a good, you know, several times a year mm -hmm. with one thing or another. But yeah, it's it's weird. Temperature changes. We have big humidity changes here. That all affects the the neck and the the bridge and everything. Frets only last so long. So yeah, it's good to keep keep up with it. So you mentioned having looking. You mentioned looking for some unique options, like a dulcimer, for example. Yeah. Is that something that's a sort of like ongoing thing for you where you might like hear a sound or see something that just kind of looks different and cool and then wonder how you could use that as a little extra thing in your tool bag to just pull out if, if something calls for it? Always, yeah. Is that a helpful way to maybe like to set yourself apart in some ways? Do you look at that as being something where, you know, someone could trust you to kind of be the person that can find this little thing to kind of fit it in? Producers, artists, songwriters are always looking for something to make their songs stand out or make their records stand out and, and be unique because there's, you know, so much been done already. The latest thing is I just got this rubber saddle guitar, which is really cool. And it's, it's got a pickup and uh, it's got this real th cool thuddy kind of thing to it. But yeah, I'm always looking. Are there any things that you've done to like treat an instrument as opposed to like using a completely different type of instrument um, when it comes to guitars? Um, to treat them in a way that would kind of give it a different sort of effect. One, one example that comes to mind is is just like how you can put some like material through uh, up at the top of the strings to like mute certain like things. Oh, right. you know? Yeah. And so that might be used as like a very quick deal if you got a buzz going on and you and you can't get the guitar set up in the middle of the session. But then I've seen some people do things like that to actually like now dampen something or you know create some kind of effect you know with it. Um, or, or, um, using like a, 
uh, percussive thing to like, you know, hit the strings or using the body of the guitar, like as a percussive instrument to be able to add a little bit of something to it. Are there, are there any things like that that you've ever, that you've discovered or that you like to do? I have, I have done all of that. Um, there was one guy that I worked with a long time ago that I remember that he would put a piece of paper, weave a piece of paper in, in and out of the strings and then play it like a, and it would sort of have like a shaker kind of sound. And I guess, I think maybe Johnny Cash might have done something like that. I've got a, a uh, like a tackle box full of picks that are all different, you know, different thin picks, heavy picks. You know, I'm always looking for new picks. I mean, because it, it makes a difference. I have a piece of foam uh, that I keep in my bag that had that, you know, I'll put like next to the bridge and, and that kind of gives it like a little arch top sound. So all of those things work. So when you're, when you're in a traditional tracking environment with other players, what sort of things do, do you listen to first when you're getting ready to, to go in the, the room and track with, as a band? Where, where does your mind go with, with determining or informing what it is that you're going to play first? Like, like in the process, you're, you listen to the work tape, you go in, you're preparing to play. Mm -hmm. You need to decide, you know, the rhythm, the voicing, the guitar you're going to use, you know, mm -hmm. what sort of th thoughts go through your mind in that, in that preparation process of figuring out what your first step is going to be. When I hear the song, I, I decide pretty quickly what guitar at least is going to be the first thing that I'm going to do. Cause it, typically on most songs, I'm playing at least two tracks. So I'll decide what's, what guitar I want to use. A lot of times the, the writer or the artist or whatever is playing acoustic guitar. So I feel like most of the time I want to be them, at least because that's what they're used to. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a capo position or if it's a, even stylistically, if they're finger picking, if they're strumming, I want to try to make them comfortable by hearing that first. And then from that, I go, what's the best complimentary thing that's going to work with that, that part? You know, is it another capo position? Um, it's probably going to be another instrument and not the same guitar. That's a great point to listen to the demo. And, the, and especially if the artist or, or, or writer that's hiring you, it was the one that played it because as we all know, every, you know, player has their own, or and especially artists that aren't necessarily like the session player has their own like go-to way of shaping certain chord progressions. Mm-hmm strumming patterns or everyone's got kind of like their own art our, our internal rhythm where they may push on certain accents or just you know that those those sort of things that are just kind of like i feel like built within us rhythmically you know right yeah and uh, so we have like our go-to's that we just kind of lean towards every player is slight can be slightly different with that the job of a se session player is to be that chameleon you know and so you hear that and instead of just immediately going to your own tendency you're listening for what were they doing so I can make my the first thing that I play feel as much like them as possible. Right. Wow. That's my first goal. Um, and the trick of it is a lot of times they've got like one trick, you know, and they're, they're they get good at it, you yeah. know, and so you've got to be able to do their trick better than them, like a lot better than them right now. And so that's that can be the, you know, it may be a funky tuning or it may be it's like this little, I don't know, some, you know, right hand thing or that's the goal for me to make them feel comfortable for me to make them feel like, oh, that's my song, mm -hmm. you know, instead of some thing that I'm coming up with, you know. My second part, I take a few more liberties and, and try to do some kind of complimentary thing. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to drums, drums are oftentimes the first kind of focus yeah. for everybody. What do you focus on with the drums to be able to to play with them and in, su in support of them? It's pretty much the hi-hat is the big thing. What is the hi-hat informing within your playing? How it's done, you know, whether it's swinging or is it straight? That's kind of the thing that I cue in on. Uh, one thing I really like too is like if I'm overdubbing a banjo, a lot of times the drummer will be overdubbing a, a tambourine or a shaker. And I love that because I'm hearing all nice, clear subdivisions. But yeah, that's that's it probably more than anything is the hi-hat. So that's telling you where your your general like subdivision on your rhythm part is going to be sort of led by. Yeah. And then are there some times where 
that is already covered, so you don't want to fill that space. So you, where do you decide to play along with them versus leaving that area open for that for the drums to drive that? It, it the song kind of defines that, you know. If it's a uh, you know if it's a more open kind of ballady kind of thing, it's going to be up to me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to be driving a lot of eighth notes through that. It, it, again, it's, you know, I can not necessarily jive. I mean, you, you want to play well with everybody, mm -hmm. but if the most noticeable thing that sounds wrong or, or bad mm -hmm. is you're not linking up with the, with the drums. Right. And then of course you're listening to everybody, you know, harmonically. So on the instruments that are playing chords, what sort of things are you listening for and how does that uh, affect what it is that you decide to play? Well, tuning is huge. And it's like the, um, especially for my instruments, just because if you're not, I mean, usually with the keyboard, because the piano is, you know, isn't really exact, you know, it has its own little tempered thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the acoustic guitar and the piano are, are kind of doing things together, mm -hmm. especially like in an intro, first verse or kind of a thing. Um, so I'm listening for tuning in, in the piano and range, you know, if he's playing up high, maybe I should be down low a little bit lower. Um, for the, uh, you know, another logical thing is the, what the electric guy's doing because we're both guitars. And so if, his rhythm pattern is too different than from what I'm doing. That can either be cool or that can be confusing. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of suss that out. How much do you talk with electric players in a session about that versus just listen and you guys don't, like, don't even need to say anything? And we very rarely say anything about it unless there's something just super obvious, but rarely you have to say anything because everybody's hearing it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the great things. I mean, you you know, how many bands have we all been in where, you know, there's one or two guys that just, they don't listen to anybody else, but they just play. Mm -hmm. But that's just not a thing in the studio world. You have to listen to everybody. And that's that's one of the fantastic things about it is that everybody's leaving space for each other, you know, and we all kind of know where, you know, where our, our place is. And what do you think the end result of that ends up being as an advantage. Yeah, hopefully you end up getting a really great signing record, you know, because everything kind of fits in its place instead of like a bunch of stuff over here in this frequency and... Is there anything that you did early on to, to start to be able to do hear that, like any ear training or, or is it something that happened uh, sort of just naturally through the process of doing it where you became better at pointing out those, pinpointing those elements of frequency or harmonic stuff that needed to be separated or supported. I think, you know, like we've all done is just listen to tons of music, you know, and what is it that makes this record so great, you know, and put on the headphones and, and check it out. And, and then you discover, oh, there's this, you know, little part that the electric's doing over here in the corner that I didn't really notice. And there's this thing that the bass is doing and that really works well with the keyboard. And, um, just listening to tons of music. So as you're getting into the position where your career is at a point where you're, you're basically, you're working every day, you're a full-time, you know, session player. Do you still make time for practice? And do you still make time for like listening to music outside of work? I definitely make time for listening. I don't practice practice like scales or whatever. Um, my, my writing kind of takes that you know, I'll, I'll be experimenting in the writing world. The other thing that I've, I've come to do a little bit recently is just uh, learning songs, uh, just to learn the song, uh, a song, a popular song that I've known forever. Um, and when you learn that, what, what exactly are you learning? Is it just the, the chords or is it like you're gonna break down the whole arrangement and figure out all the parts? I just learned that how I would, I would present this song if I was a solo. And, and that's something that I've, I've started too is, and that's sort of been lacking in my world is, is the live aspect. Because really ever since my daughter was born, uh, which is, she's 22 now, I haven't really done much live work at all, um, just occasionally. 
but I'm starting to do more now because it really, it really feeds the studio thing too. So I learned songs to do like in a live way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, it's great because it, it just opens up, you know, ideas and especially if they're classic songs, you know, it's, um, and adapting them to guitar, it's, it, um, it keeps me interested and keeps me excited about it. Um, so let's talk about your writing a little bit. How is that um, weaved into your career as a, as a session player? It sounds like you've, you've kind of always been writing since you were younger in, in some capacity. Um, where does that fall into your like occupation, I guess? I've, um, you know, I've always written music for the most part, and it's only been, the lyric part of it has really only been semi-recently. I mean, I came here and thinking that I wanted to, I was starting to write a little bit before I moved here. And, uh, but I've always been much more in the music part of it and I've done it forever. And it's been, I would do it just to do it. And I really wasn't making anything with it. I've done a few like uh, sound library things. I've, I've done a few things where I'm playing everything um, and all original pieces. Mm -hmm. About a month ago, I had my first session, a tracking session of all songs that I wrote. And I'm putting together a little album for myself. Um, kind of to mark the time and, and, and for one thing, it's something I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't have aspirations to be like, you know, a huge artist or anything. I'm, I, it's really about just wanting to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And also I wanted to have an experience of rhythm sections, especially, but at players that I love and I want to have something of that I've written with them playing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've started, you know, just piecing together, you know, different situations to, to hire guys to, to come in and play mm -hmm. my songs, but it's been really inspiring and invigorating, you know, it's sort of like this new thing to work on, you mm -hmm. know, and um, how does it impact your, your work in the, in, in sessions or how has it over the years, I think you know, having just, that writing outlet, it helps you kind of absorb some of the things that maybe might have been a little tiresome, you know, if you just know that you have something else going on in, in your creative world that uh, it's not all tied up in this one little world. Mm -hmm. So it makes it, are you saying that it makes it easier to maybe say you come up with a part that you love on a session and then the producer is like, um, yeah, what else you got? Right. And you were like, this is incredible, you know? And right. then that, that idea gets shut down. If you don't have another outlet to sort of have that creative identity, it can start to maybe build up, you know, or become in, in that way. If you're, and also if you're unable to kind of separate the two, but if you're saying that it's helpful in that way to be able to help you absorb the things that maybe you're having to do redundantly or the limited creative freedom that you have in that and then you're able to apply that into that which allows you to stay more focused in the session i i think it's just it's good to to pay attention to your inspirational tank and when it's just naturally can start to get a little low if you're doing if you get on a run of of just doing the same thing you know we people uh especially in the songwriting world can get into like a thing you know like you know this the song, even progressions that become like, oh my God, that's the same progression that I played all week. So you can, you're, you're not getting a lot of inspiration from that. So you need something else to kind of bring that, that level back up. And mm -hmm. that, that's really helped for me just to have right. something that I have total control over. I can, you know, everybody's got a home rig now too. I can, I can send, you know, I want a trombone part. I can send it off to this guy and he's going to put a fantastic thing, you know, mm -hmm. and then I can put it together and I can edit and I can, so that it's just help. So if you look back on the, the length of this amazing career that you've had and all the great accomplishments that you've been able Is to it have amazing, really? along the way, I mean, <laughs> I think so. Um, uh, I mean, as long as I've been in town, you've been one of the guys and I know that it's been quite yeah. a while before that. And I mean, I've been here for a bit. So, I mean, you've been, your career has really been, I mean, covered a wide range of, you know, things with the extent of the success that you've had in your career. And you look at that longevity. Are there any things that stand out to you that you recognize as being something that was a strong skill set for you to build that allowed you to maintain that versus maybe the folks that haven't had that 
length of success or been able to extend their careers out in the in the extent that you've had the ability to? I think care is really really big, and I think it's it's really it because it it's it's very obvious to who you're working with. Um, player wise and and artist wise, if you can maintain the care and a, again being fed inspirationally, if it's not from your day to day, you know sessions or whatever, some other way to to keep that up, I think that makes a big difference because it's sort of like it nothing is ever stays in one place. You know, you're either moving forward or you're moving back, and so that effort to 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 care about what's going on. And if it's if it's not necessarily that song, maybe it's the person, maybe it's the story, maybe it's the whatever it is that you can latch on to to bring out the best in you and not to not to phone it in. You know, we can all play good enough to put a decent part down, but when you are really caring, you know, Maybe that's offering an idea on something, you know, maybe that's not offering an idea on something. Maybe mm -hmm. it's staying quiet, maybe uh, whatever it could be. That's such a powerful statement. Just caring and caring authentically and finding the thing that you can really latch onto. And when you do that, there's all these other play. Uh, there's there's plenty of people that can play, play their instrument. Mm -hmm. But when you can play it with care and compassion and intention around it, that's what really stands out and it's clear that you do that in the sessions that i've had the privilege of working with you on you care about what you're doing you come in you're a great hang you bring so much you know to the to the environment that you're in and uh, it's clear that that's why you've had the level of success and longevity in your career that you have well thank you i feel so grateful to be able to have this conversation with you and learn more about your background. We've, we've got to spend time working on sessions before, but yeah. I haven't had the, the privilege to be able to sit down and really learn about where you came from and you know and what goes into it. I think people are going to have so much to learn from this. Thank you for joining us and doing this with us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure.